Okay, well, data has been a huge talking point here on uh, the Singapore FinTech Festival 2020, this global channel. It's come up in a number of panels and fireside conversations. It certainly did in my conversation with uh, Infosys chairman Nandan Nilakani earlier today. Ever wondered how data is actually being leveraged to make business decisions and understand customer behavior better? With every competitive advantage comes specific constraints. So the question is, how will we see that data war play out in 2021? So Sanjeev Kalita, who is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Guppy.ai, will moderate now a panel consisting of Paolo Cironi, who is the global research leader in banking and financial markets for IBM, Nikhil Kumar, who is co-founder and chief evangelist at Setu, Dr. Lida Gliptis, a chief client officer at 10x Future Technologies, and Ridiman Das, who is co-founder and chief executive officer of Triple Blind. Let's go live to the panel now. Hi, thank you very much, Manisha. It is truly a pleasure to be here at the Singapore FinTech Festival. And uh, as you just mentioned, we have an amazing panel of, uh, and, and including myself, there are five speakers. We're all in five different time zones. Uh, and, you know, so hopefully we can bring a truly global perspective on data. And as Manisha, as you mentioned, uh, data is becoming more and more important in terms of value creation, in terms of customer experiences, in terms of business operations, in terms of everything. So in this panel, we, we're going to look at that. And in, in my background, I have a, a picture of uh, Sun Tzu, uh, the, uh, from, uh, the, 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 uh, who wrote The Art of War in China. And we're, we're, we're looking at data from a artistic view as well as from a more practical view and uh, so it, we have a lot lot of lot to talk about so let, let's just re jump right into it um so the first uh topic i wanted to cover a little bit was about having a high level view of data and in my background uh there's a painting by the french painter georges surat a sunday afternoon on the island of la grande jatte painted 1884 to 1886. And the reason I put that is that data is a bunch of dots, which by itself isn't that interesting or useful. But when you're able to organize the dots, you're able to see and know things. For example, when not dots come together in this painting, they show people, places, objects, weather, and, and, and extend that, you know, it, it helps us think about, okay, how we have all these individual dots. How can we get a true picture of what's happening and, in fact, what is true? So the first question I wanted to get into was uh, talking a little bit about uh, how you might have used data to learn something surprising in, in the past and how you might have applied it. Um, so actually, let, let's start off with maybe with Paolo. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you use data to learn something surprising in the past and how Makes did you sense. apply it? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Sanjeev, and hello, everybody. You see, I started my professional career in investment banking, and for 15 years, uh, I was head of quantitative risk management for uh, capital markets and financial institutions. And I always thought that risk managers are like artists because they try to do something crazy. They look at the past to predict the future. It is all about taking time series, which maybe is more conventional data than the data we discussed today, and trying to figure out what it tells us about the next shift in the financial markets. Now, what I learned instead is that the future is open. And what we always need to remind ourselves is that uncertainty is lurching behind the curve because our data, even our big data, does not contain the future. Now, that does not mean that we cannot use data. It means that we need to learn how to use the data reminding ourselves that we are not discussing about certainty, but we're discussing about probabilities and correlations that the data is telling us about behaviors, about people, and ultimately about human beings out there. And if we start from this perspective, then we learn how to be ethical in using the data because we can more, if you like, openly and transparently discuss the limitation and the powerfulness of that. Thank you very much, Carlo. Uh, Nikhil, actually, maybe if you can talk a little bit about how you've used data in the past to find something surprising. Um, 
I think like, you know, practically we've probably been using data from a business application point of view, you know, some or the other point in our lives, you know, whether it's, whether if you're running a sales and marketing process or whether you're running a customer success process and, um, and so on and so forth. Um, I think for me, like something very interesting in the recent times that's been, you know, using data was, has been like in, in something as mundane as hiring. Uh, just looking at like, you know, the kind of people who, who apply to a startup like ours, you know, where are these people coming from, uh, you know, and what are their motivations of why they're applying and then, you know, what works best and what kind of funnels work best for us. Uh, this is something that's been very surprising and, you know, and, I mean, and a lot many times like data tells you, you know, data tells you the truth, right? Uh, you know, you'd like to believe we are engaged with like, various different multiple like agencies who we are paying a lot of money and we realized uh, most of our conversions were happening from our own people who were referring. Um, and then we just use that information to like double down and like pay more uh, referrals to our employees so that they can get bringing the best people that they want to work with. Um, so that's something very surprising. Even I, like I didn't imagine that it would be the case. Uh, but then, you know, when uh, we did this blind thing for a year as a company, and then once we started putting metrics into it and start measuring, um, we really saw these like interesting, surprising results. And that, that's a great example of actually, and in Google, we used to say eating our own dog food. Uh, that's a great example. Uh, actually, can we go on to Leda? Uh, how, can you talk a little about uh, a, some, when you've learned something surprising with data and how you might have applied that? I can, I can. Um, and, and I was, I was smiling as um, Paolo was being profoundly smart and philosophical, and Nikhil was talking about you know data telling you the truth. Because for me, the most uh, memorable experience was a time when. Data told us the truth, but we didn't know what it meant. And it was a it was a pivotal moment in my career uh, and the industry because it was about ten years ago. So you can work out what bank I'm talking about probably by looking through my LinkedIn profile. But we had just uh, launched some capabilities that allowed us to really dig into the the pulse of the organization, look at a um, a, a very rich environment of 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 data points, as you say, dots and start synthesizing a picture. So we were uh, at the time transitioning from a mindset of technology for revenue protection to technology for relationship deepening. So we were like, okay, we're gonna go to the, the, the relationship managers and we're gonna get on the phone to the clients and we're going to tell them what we found. So we get on the call, this massive, massive um, uh, asset management client and, and we're like, so, we have this amazing data around your your transactions and your trading activity, and you don't make money on a Tuesday. And they were like, what? And we're like, well, we're looking at your transaction volumes and at trading costs, and net-net, you have a lot of activity, smaller tickets, you don't make money on a Tuesday. And they were like, oh my God, this is amazing, this is so insightful, why? And we're like, uh, we don't know. So let's have a workshop. And we have this incredible workshop and we we didn't know. And it was this very interesting and it was an extremely valuable moment, but it was really awkward because it was like, we don't know why, but we know it is true. And the because of the moment in time, the traditional organization's urge was to look back and say, well, why? And it was really interesting to see actually the um, the CEO of the client going, you know what, it doesn't matter why. What matters is that Tuesday is the best day for us to do employee training and to do all of that like non value additive activity that takes us away from whatever. And while we're doing that, maybe we'll see some more trends. In the years I was there, we never found out why these guys didn't make money on a Tuesday, but it was absolutely brilliant because data told us the truth. Um, but we didn't necessarily have the tools to understand it and yet it could inform action, which was quite telling. Wow, that, that, that's that's an amazing example. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I, and I, I actually, uh, let's move on to Ridiman. Um, can you talk a little bit about an example? You, you have a tough acts to follow, but can you talk Very about so. uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, a time where you learned something surprising with data and how you applied it? Of course. Yeah. So. 
uh, a couple of years ago, um, by way of background, I have a, uh, I worked at a, a biometrics company, which was then acquired by the large fintech group in Asia called Ant, Ant Group. And at Ant, we tried to make a shift from just uh, verifying the identity of a person to trying to identify them in a store. And because of the nature of the Alipay ecosystem, we had so much data, and I was really surprised at the fidelity at which we could really use all of that data to try to pinpoint, okay, Sanjeev or Leda or any one of these people look like they are in this store, and let's narrow the search space under which we are trying to verify the identities of these people. And we were able to do that in a privacy-preserving way. Um, so it was, you know, it, while it does seem like it might have been broader connotations, uh, it was actually uh, profound because it, it enabled us to deliver an experience where someone could walk into the store, pick up their items, and then just show their face at a, at a cashless register and walk out. And uh, the chance of misidentification was really, really, really low because of just the amount of data we had on the individual. So that was one of the interesting things I learned um, uh, while working with Alipay's uh, almost 2 billion user base. Wow, that, that, that's another amazing example. And uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, I, I think that the takeaway for me is for all, from all of that is is, is basically that uh, you, there's so many data points out there, and the applications are actually endless. And it, it really comes down to you know what what are we thinking about? How do we want to apply it? And that that actually goes to my next um, uh, next uh, set of questions. Which is about um, you know moving on from pointillism to surrealism. You know, th this painting, in my background, is by Salvador Dali. Um, and if you look at the painting overall, you can see a woman's face. You know the the, the hills in the background are, are eyes, and then the um, then the uh, the uh, women and and the and the child. They look like the um, uh, which we call it the um, uh, uh, the, the chin and the lips of um, of, uh, of of a person. So, uh, you know, d depending on how what you're looking for, you know, you can have very different uh, uh, outcomes. So, I, I actually, maybe Leda, uh, can we start off with you, and uh, let's learn hear your perspectives on how are organizations using and interpreting data uh, for different and uh, purposes and for competitive advantage. Um, that's a good question. I, I wish one of the smarter people had gone first now, so I could go like I thought of that first too. Um, I, I would say um, we in the in the in our industry we have talked about data being the new oil for a very long time, and it really pisses me off when people do that. Sorry, Pat. Um, and and it annoys me for two reasons. Oil is finite, and we know how to make money with it. Data is neither. And I think from a financial services perspective, particularly the incumbents have spent a long time looking at data, thinking we have a lot of it, we should know how to make a lot of money with it. And it, we, we spent a lot of time and effort not being able to figure out the answer to that. And I, and I hope my co-founders will agree. We didn't because it was an entirely the wrong question to ask. So in the last few years, we have started realizing that it's not about how much data you have, but about what information your service requires in order for it to be contextual and useful. So with that in mind, and as it's actually a fairly um, new moment of realization, I'm seeing three fundamental changes. One is... Um, data discipline in big organizations, less about how can we monetize the data we have and more, how can we actually schematically leverage the data we have? What is it that we need to know and what is it that we need to know from it in order to create um, contextual services that are respectful of privacy? And it becomes an infrastructure conversation <clears throat> rather than a, a data conversation. It's about what I need to do as a day-to-day -day exercise. The second thing that I'm seeing, um, which is around, uh, which is extremely powerful, is uh, contextualization in services. Companies like Bond AI, for instance, that, that bring 
empathy into what is normally highly static traditional exercises such as onboarding. Um, and and the, the balance between the two could be transformational for our industry because if the infrastructure providers like the space I operate in or the, um, the banking providers manage to understand and think of themselves as data processors, I mean, this is what I need to extract from the data that flows through and this is what I need to look like in order to be able to do that, then some of the... Um, innovations and, and new capabilities that are coming out that use that data for contextual in the moment services will be extremely value additive and transformative for the consumer. So I'm sort of, my answer to your question is, is, is half and half. We spend a lot of time thinking it would look one way and it didn't, but I think we're actually onto the right track now. Okay. <clears throat> No, that, 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 that's, that's a great uh, start for this discussion. And I think, uh, actually, maybe, uh, Paolo, if, if we, we can yes. go up to you. Um, and I, I think Leda brought up some several good points, but uh, I know that in the past, you know, even when we were talking earlier about, for example, like transparency and stuff like that, uh, I, I, you know, it seems like you've got a great yeah, vein so of uh, discussion. Let me let me tell you, when I look at this Salvador Dali painting, uh, it reminds me of the difference between data-driven banking and data-enabling clients. Because what I see, whether I see the child uh, with the mother or uh, uh, the person, the face that pops up from the background, is my point of view. Mm -hmm. I don't know the point of view of the people which are inside the painting. So my point of view is the data-driven banking, and inside the painting would be the point of view of the client, enabling the client to sell that themselves. Mm -hmm. Why is this important? Because I think that um, Silicon Valley made the fundamental mistakes uh, in the last 10 years of fintech innovation, which is reflected in much less disruption than people would have thought. And that misunderstanding is the fact that they didn't understand that mobile technology, digital, is a pull technology, is a technology of the demand. But most of the revenues that matter in financial services operate in an offer-driven technology. So we need to ask ourselves how we position an offer-driven industry, sorry, not technology, an offer-driven industry on a demand-driven technology. Mm -hmm. So then using data to understand the client can be very powerful, but you risk to create a mechanism where you bucket them into a certain profile, which is uh, in the end not very much personalized, and you try to target them by selling financial products. Now, we know well from the early days of Amazon that the distribution channel of products on digital might not work that well if you do not resolve another important element, which is the one of motivation. That is data-driven banking. Now, that it is valuable, but it has to be preceded by something else. So using data to provide the client those elements that enable the client to make their own decisions on digital whenever they feel they want to do that. One example was also mentioned by later before is what um, SBI on one of the Debian clients created uh, with the EO Limit One. Now, I believe that even though they use uh, AI and data at best, uh, what made them different is that they learned that using non-banking to precede banking uh, would enable people to, you know, drive themselves into the conversation in a way they will feel more empowerful to move forward, reducing this gap between the demand and supply side of the industry and technology. That is the key element that needs to be resolved. So therefore, we need to learn to use the data in a way that we ask ourselves not just how much do we understand about the client, but how much the client will understand about us as bankers, as fintech entrepreneurs, provided the solutions, so that on a platform economy, they will be free to move around, they will be motivated, they will be sticky with us, they will be reward us in a way that is not just freemium, but is money that they can pay for because they see the value of the relationship. Well, well, thank you, thank you, Paolo. And and I think that you you know the, your comments about platform are, are very interesting. And and actually, maybe if we go to Nikhil. Uh, because, uh, in fact, you've built platforms for a national, from a national perspective, and now you're obviously building d different, you know, a, a private platform. Uh, you know, what, what's your, in, any thoughts as far as competitive advantage, data, and when you're thinking about platforms? I think in India, we've had this, like, unique opportunity to miss a lot of these digitization waves and learn from the mistakes that have happened in the West and then get them right in the East. Um, so in some sense, you know, uh, 
in in india the digitization story is just like 3 to 4 years old uh, you know we have a reverse problem in india where there isn't enough data about people even to do good things mm-hmm. uh, so we're just getting started uh where we are trying to create these digital platforms that will enable people to come and participate in the digital economy so to speak and then uh, the the learnings have been you know obviously is that the the model that that as paulo is talking about which is the 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 ad model was essentially you know data is an data is the new oil and things like that was always used to like make bring out business outcomes right so they were not they were never like targeted and making your life or my life better uh, data has always been thought about like you know how do we sell more how do we make more revenues uh, you know how do we increase like penetration of products and so on and so forth right so the whole search model the whole ad tech model is based on this premise that you know if you can get more and more data about people you can increase consumption and then if you increase consumption there's more commerce and then therefore there's economic growth and so on and so forth you know the problem in countries like india and you know if you go to southeast asia and so on there isn't enough uh, economic parity for people to actually consume so many products and services so in some sense like ad tech as a business model is not really you know uh, viable in these countries because people really are you know they're poor um, they need to be brought out of this you know that's why you know we talk about financial inclusion as a big thing because you know we're still trying to give them a financial product forget about selling a house or a car and things like that to them right um so in india we're trying to flip this around and you know and that's part of i think what nandan was also talking about earlier today in the sessions is like how do we empower an individual by giving them their data back um and i think a lot of the global dialogue has been about like you know what will businesses do with data rather than that we should ask this question as like paulo was talking about like what are consumers are going to do with data like can we enable consumers to be in control of their data and thereby get you know value added business services um uh, it could be you know someone who you know it, it could be someone trying to find the right educational course for them it could be somebody who is trying to figure out what's the right credit product that i should buy or it could be someone who is trying to figure out like what's the right insurance for my business right uh so we are like trying to flip the script around and say if you know all of these digital data yeah traces i mean digital footprints that have been created rather than the ownership being transferred to businesses on whom which we have no control over um can the script be flipped around so that consumers are in control of their data and then build an application layer on top of it so that you know businesses can innovate on on consented data if if i as a user if i'm sharing to say hey make my you know banking screen personalized i'm going to share all of this information so don't sh- show me all these icons that you would otherwise show that's the flip that we are probably looking at in the next 10 to 15 years where uh, you know as we keep talking about like data and personalization uh, this is this is the thing right so you need to allow the user to personalize uh, you know experiences for them by giving them access to their own data and then empowering them with these applications on top Sergio so, can I comment very fast because Nikki said something very very important the fintech ecosystem was born like a simple minded startup they were configured like distributional channel products very linear but on digital platforms are the winners in the very end and platforms operate in a different way so Nikki thought about talked about output economies and outcome economies output economies means BMW wants to sell 1 million cars next year outcome means BMW wants to mobilize with car sharing 1 million customers every day next year. In banking output means I want to sell 1 billion asset under management of this monetary fund, but on the platform economy the outcome means I want to help my clients achieve their personal, their business and their financial goals. And this is a copernical flip of the concept of fintech into the platform economy. So as the fintech ecosystem did not really think platform but linear, they were not successful as they thought, but this is the time where you see the value of data in a different way to enable the client to self their self their themselves to give them back the power and they clients we reward you as uh, those that made them possible. Yeah. Thank thank you. And and I, I actually maybe if uh, we, we go to Ridman um a lot of great t- uh, points there about 
you know, the flipping of the use of data, control of data, and and how it's going to be changing in the short term as well as you know longer term. Uh, you know how 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 is data changing uh, and interpretation of data changing uh, our thinking of competitive advantage? Yeah, I think. Uh I'll build on top of what Leda just said, which is, you know, if oil is the analogy that is used with data, uh, but the difference is it's finite and we know how to make money with it. The reason why the economy around data hasn't, mat hasn't matured, if you will, is around the risks of privacy abuse, right? Um, our consumer data is often regulated. Uh, in India, it's regulated by Indian national privacy law. In, in China, of course, it's the same. Uh, in Europe, it's GDPR. And what those, what those do, those well-meaning regulations trap data inside enterprises and banks and financial institutions so that the maximum utility of it cannot be extracted, right? If you think about it today, for me as an individual, I use one bank for my credit card, another one for my checking account, another one for uh, my mortgage, and those don't necessarily talk to each other or can improve upon each other or figure out specifically what my entire financial picture is, right? Uh, so as a result of that data, liquidity is hampered and hindered, and what we're seeing today is more emphasis placed on privacy that really does enable... Uh, from a consumer standpoint, prior informed revocable consent of the individuals as data is being shared among institutions for a particular purpose. Um, and those are enforced sort of in a in a proactive way rather than a reactive, we'll catch the abuse later as opposed to we'll enforce uh, the digital rights on the data. So I'm excited for the potential for what that leads uh, to in terms of personal finance, next generation of credit bureaus, uh, and uh, like Nikhil was saying, putting consumers back in the control of their own data, uh, especially in a way that uh, adds value to them as opposed to is rent seeking from the big companies. Thank you. So, and um, my next question is, is basically a short answer question and, and just maybe a, a quick sentence afterwards. But uh, when you personally look at that, this picture from Salvador Dali, do you see the, the, the big face or do you see the woman and the child and, and, and why? Uh, actually, let's start with Paulo. Well, as I said, I see them both holistically because that's what is needed, an holistic point of view around clients. How about you, Nikhil? Uh, I do see the woman and child, like, you know, probably because I'm short-sighted. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I think like, uh, you know, I think most times we, are, we do see things that are quite obvious to us and, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily make out, but, but yeah, that's what I see. <laughs> How about you, Leda? I confess I, I see the woman and the child, and I can think of a, a much grander metaphor if I didn't. But I'm uh, I'm okay with just seeing the woman and the child because I think one of the things we're driving from this is utility, right? If we're if we're moving to an era where we have the ability and, and increased sophistication of of processing data in order to do great things what are those things and what's the usefulness and what's what's the angle that is um, the right shape to serve the humans in our communities? Who oh, I did it. I found the analogy. I'm very proud of that. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful it as always. Uh, Riddiman. You know, I, 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 I'll piggyback on top of Paolo. I see both of them and then I'm going to go look uh, much more closely than I have to see if there's any hidden patterns that I can reveal uh, in, in that in that picture. So hey, hey, macro first, then micro. Has anybody seen the seagull? That actually leads me to another question. You know, knowing yourself and, and the way that you look at things, you know, uh, you're obviously all building teams. Like, how do you, what, what might be the other type of person that you'd want to complement the way you look at something from a data perspective? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any, anyone, any, anyone want to jump in? that's uh, yeah, on really the not. reverse, right? Someone that yeah. looks for the micro patterns first and then zooms out as opposed to my strategy of looking at from, you know, the big picture first and then going down to the details. So uh, I would want to work with someone that brings the other perspective, especially, um, you know, if we're, um, if we're looking for patterns in something that are not quite as obvious. 
I would like I to guess Laribe, who's a philosopher. Yeah. <laughs> because it is the interpretation around the data and how to use that in the information economy. Right. You're the philosopher. <laughs> I would say it's that, that view from nowhere, and I find that it's extremely useful in any team, uh, but definitely when you're looking at big data sets and trying to 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 drive that utility, it's um, it's the, the people who's mindset but also their experience is different to yours and therefore they're looking for different patterns i'll actually share the same uh, you know i think all of us probably in the panel have a little bit of too much of a macro view of the world um and you know i'd, I'd like to like compliment you know ourselves with like people who can like look at like you know things that are happening on ground today and then you know give us insights about what's going on um especially a lot of quantitative insights you know uh, today i kind of like i'm i driven a lot through intuition when you know i learn through people uh, but i'd love to learn flip that into you know try to learn more through data than just through people totally totally that's great and 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 uh, i in, in the interest of time i'm just going to move on to the, the next uh, set of uh, uh, questions and and this image and i apologize for Viewers, my, my camera is uh, a little bit on the fritz right now, but uh, hopefully you can see that uh, you know there's islands that are surrounded by pink fabric, and this is a picture of a photo of an art installation by uh, the artists Christo and Jean Claude in 1983 when they surrounded several islands in Biscayne Bay near Miami with pink fabric. You know, and th this unexpected installation was possible with things of plastic technology. And one of the reasons is uh, that I wanted to bring this picture is that data often resides on separate islands and, you know, it, or in silos, which is probably a more common um, term, uh, but, you know, but, but can be accessed or even unified by technology. And uh, much like these separate islands are visually unified here, um, and, and, and so I, I wanted to uh, get into a little bit of a discussion about um, how can organize, organizations unite uh, these disparate islands of separate data and, and, and get them together and so that you're able to, in fact, get a better picture of, of what's, hap what's happening. Um, maybe later, maybe, or actually we started with you first last time. Nikhil, why, why don't we start with you this time? Well, I mean, um... I think like, you know, I, I've always thought about it in like three, you know, like broadly in three areas. Uh, I think for somebody like something like this, we do need policy intervention to happen. Um, I think without that policy, you know, like intervention in place, whether it's the government or whether it's even a self-regulatory framework or the regulators, I think there is a call for you know, uh, some sort of like synergy, you know, by bringing everybody in the industry together. And, you know, the like the one who has this control is probably the governments and regulators and so on. I think there is definitely policy intervention that's required. Um, second, uh, if there are policy interventions, there need to be platforms that need to be built or enabled on top of them so that it unlocks these data. Uh, data sets from various different sources and so on, uh, which could be through, you know, standardization, through specs and so on. But, you know, I think the world of data is in, in a position where all these things around standardization probably don't really matter anymore, um, given the way machine learning and AI is, you know, building up schema. We don't really need schemas. You can probably do learning on the edge to, to be able to do that. But nevertheless, you need platforms that unlock these data sets. And then the third layer being the product layer, which is, you know, uh, once you unlock these data sets, there should be products that are built, which serve, which which have some meaningful, you know, experience for end consumers um, in terms of, you know, it could be a personal finance management app, it could be a, a robo advisory, whatever that it is. But I would look at it this like three different uh, areas because, you know, everybody's got a role to play. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just not like one person is responsible for this. Okay, great. And actually, I just realized that we're really uh, getting towards the end of the session. Uh, maybe Leda, if you can, uh, quick 30 seconds on uniting data. My quick 30 seconds is that it has to be purpose driven for all the challenges we have discussed before, regulatory, the right to privacy, compliance, 
Um, and the fact that for a lot of the incumbent institutions, uh, the infrastructure they have uh, is very much like the islands in the, in the image behind you, not designed in order to <clears throat> unify data. And therefore, if we try to sticky plaster our way into a connected ecosystem, we would create more problems than we would solve. So I would say that rather than trying to transition ourselves with all of our baggage, it's a case of being purpose driven within the parameters of both what is right and what is permitted. And the two are uh, equally solid pillars and creating new capabilities that are data first to serve that purpose rather than trying to figure out how to connect what we already have. So my 30 seconds. If you want the precondition, you go to my LinkedIn page. I released yesterday the latest paper entitled uh, Banking on Open Hybrid Multi Cloud. So that you need to make sure that your processes can basically utilize data. So, Open Hybrid Multi Cloud is the only technology and environment that enables you to power with data all of the other exponential technologies, name them artificial intelligence, IoT, and so on and so forth. So that is the precondition to make sure that you build open business architectures that can consume data, uniting them inside the processes that matter for the institution and for the client. Go and check the paper. And my 10 seconds <laughs> at the end is, uh, I think we're going to see the clash of two separate trends. I think we're going to see enterprises unifying their data silos and, and developing catalogs and, and governance uh, around it. And yet at the same time, we're going to see nation states come up with uh, more privacy frameworks like GDPR, like data residency, that's going to cause more and more silos to happen. So it's in the reconciliation of these two polar opposite trends that we will see some, some innovation and opportunities for uh, data discovery and, uh, and, and redu reduction of silos without breaking privacy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, truly an amazing session. Uh, and I, I guess uh, maybe I'll hand it back to Manisha. Uh, and uh, hopefully you guys got some value out of this session. I certainly did. Thanks we so much. Thank you. We absolutely did. Sanjeev and the whole panel, that was fantastic. And some great knowledge being shared. What an intriguing conversation. Indeed, data, a very powerful business lever. And we have the panel of experts. It was so, so well moderated there with a lot of philosophy as well. Thanks so much for all those key takeaways.